Hello, and welcome to Openly Gamer Theater's Tower of the Ape. A Savage Worlds Deluxe roleplay drama from the producers of Gamer's Table. Be warned, this production may contain some explicit material that may not be suitable for all audiences. And I'm playing the luckiest. This is Dan. I'm going to be playing Matadai. This is Shannon, and I'm playing Lovaisa. Hi, this is Dave, and I'm playing Ronyos. Hello, my name is Jason. I'm playing Odored Soractus. And I'm Sean. I'm playing Mofir. Dawn colored the cresting waves kissing the top sails of the Kamar, bobbing like a cork on the Villiette. Two haggard-faced men sat watching the sun rise with little interest, eyes showing the vacant hollow of men accepting their fate. The reason for their melancholy was simple. Slow death stalked them on black shadowed wings. Thumping of feet beneath scarcely attracted their attention. Even when men emerged, gore-soaked from the below decks laden with charnel burdens, the two watched the sea unblinking. It wasn't until a voice rumbled deeply behind them did they move, which was to turn their heads to face the massive fighting men whose sword was responsible for the majority of the slaughter below. A splash marked the last funeral of their former comrades. Only the mutilated corpse of the captain remained, a gaping rend where his heart used to be. It was said that the captain fell prey to a dark monstrosity, but the remaining crew only knew the pale devils that stalked their decks now, forcing them to dispose of fallen comrades and erase the signs of their butchery. They turned back to scrubbing sanguine trails from the deck. Trepidation crossed their faces as bleak reality set in. After the crew was murdered by the passengers, there was not enough hands to sail her. She was adrift, miles a sea, with barely enough stores to last a few weeks. Renard Duran grimly watched the wretched sailors as the last remnants were cast overboard. He took no joy in what he had done. He was forced to kill a majority of the crew, and now he and his companions' fate was uncertain. The thought of his companions stirred him from his thoughts. He knew that Lovaisa, the brutish she-devil from the frozen wastes of Asgard, was below decks attempting to see to the slaves sequestered in the sealed chamber of the lowest deck. As for his other comrades, 
Velak, the strange man to whom Reynard pledged his sword, he knew was seeing Tyronios, who had been near Comatose since witnessing the demon creature that took Captain Symok's heart. He pointed to the blood-stained deck, glowering at the remaining seamen. As they gathered swabs and joined their mates, the Poitanian went below to find the others. Did we kill the first mate? That's an excellent question. Oh, good. Because the first mate's body is not found. Oh. Sailors that you have, you find out, are the newest members of the crew. I'm in the captain's chamber. What's left of it? Going through his stuff. Gold gleamed and gems flashed as Valax thrust both of his hands into a beam of sunlight, slicing the gloom of the captain's cabin. Jewel-crusted rings and other baubles heaped in his clutches. The abaft windows remained open, as they had been all night permitting the morning sun, but also a cleansing breeze, eliminating the stench of the dead captain that lay where they had found him. Renyard had wanted to dispose of the carcass, but he was short-sighted, not knowing that there was a use for such material, uses that only Valachias knew. The queer-eyed man turned his attention to Ronios, who, having finished picking the lock of the first of the dead captain's sea chest, was stoically working on the second. He watched the Zamorian thief's back for a moment, then turned as Renyard entered the chamber. Any of those coins... Have aquiline mint belong to me. The haggard thief casually points to the sea chest beside him that stood open. When Renyard steps forward to see, Ronios opens his hand to indicate the amassed wealth stacked within, then waves off the Poitanian with a brazen impatience, returning to his current task while attempting to mask the shaking of his hands. Well, keep at it. I want to explore the hole. So I tell the girls to stay inside and keep it locked. Okay. Unless it's me, because they can see if it's me, right? Right, right through the slats. Yeah. You go and you unbar the hold, and you open it up, and it's empty. What? <sighs> you can't tell when the last time there was cargo here. Okay. I have an Human idea. or otherwise. Didn't Provide. he have a load of slaves? Is that what he said? That's what he said. So there's nothing. He there. had a load of slaves headed to Milos. I have an idea. As the guys are cleaning up the gore, I'm going to collect some human body fat, and I'm going to get the uh, the brazier from the galley, move it up on the deck, and I'm going to grease up some of the firewood so I can make a real black, smoky fire, possibly attract some rescuers, or possibly at least pirates that we can kill and take their ship and then have more sailors. Downcast eyes and ashen faces of the beaten sailors betrayed their thoughts. Now that the gruesome task of cleaning up after the massacre was complete, it was plain that their usefulness had ended. There were not enough hands, even for a skeleton crew, and none of them were seasoned enough to guide the ship to safety, assuming that these landlubbers would let them try. They awaited their fate, expecting it to come on the point of the Poitanian Slayer's sword. Several moments of silence stretched as they waited. Then nothing happened. They're initially very afraid of you, but then when you show them no signs that you're going to kill them, they warm up a little bit and you start asking them questions like, what happened? Who, who are you guys? Where's the first mate? Why isn't there any slaves here? Things like that. They say, well, we were just picked up on this last port and we were conscripted the night before we took off, so we don't know. And then that night when, when the fight happened, you, the rest of the crew started getting really agitated. They were saying it was a bad omen that we set sail under a blood red moon. You know, all of a sudden they just got into this fervor and they just wanted to go down and kill everybody. We do Arcana. Twelve. The Blood Red Moon, some cultures call it the Blood Moon or the Vampire Moon. Valachius, you know that uh, sometimes certain spells are only potent at certain times of the year. What mortal men would call sorcery follows a cosmic law. Yeah. Last night, you're like, oh, that's right, it was the, the Blood Moon last night, where necromatic magic is its strongest, and creatures of the night can be summoned. You'd think I'd have mentioned that beforehand. So the remaining crew is like, what are we going to do? Well, I've got this whole smoke signal plan. I'm on board with your smoke. You check the manifest of the ship. The manifest states that there are 150 slaves aboard this ship. That's uh, significantly more than there are, yes. since there are none. I'm going to uh, I'm going get the navigator's equipment and see if I can figure it out. If I'm a sorcerer and I know that certain spells are yeah. better under uh, cosmological auspices and whatnot, then... I should be able to work out a sextant. Sure. And I will stand on the... Deck and look important. On, on, on yes. the highest deck. <laughs> stand there and, and look at Stare out the rear deck. <laughs> yeah, okay. To the horizon looking for any ships. The way so the hold has not been used probably in about three weeks. But there is, in the back, there's a room. You open up this door and you see that there is a glyph on the ground, or on the bottom of the deck, and there's blood stains on it. 
Nausea and fear wash over the Aesir as she guesses the nature of the unearthly symbols and bounds out of the room and up the stairs. Though she knows nothing of sorcery, nor any other diabolism, she does know one of her companions that has familiarity in esoteric lore and other queer knowledge. Seeing Valak and a group of sailors lighting the large brazier amidships, she rushes to him and grabs his shoulder. Wordlessly, she pulls him until he reluctantly accompanies her below. Men, keep cooking this human fat. I'll be back. And don't touch these charts. Valak follows the barbarian in such an associate manner, it was obvious that he did not share her need for urgency. She glares at him from the open doorway as he crosses the threshold. Seeing his nonchalant facade crack as he beheld the markings on the deck gave her slight satisfaction, though she couldn't revel in it too much with the ominous sickness that this room gave her. That's a summoning glyph, and someone used it very recently using the blood of a virgin. I just got to taste some of it. It's definitely a virgin. Lovaisa shuddered at the thought that she and those she cared for were likely intended victims of some diabolic purpose. For a long while, she and Valak stare at the glyph in silence. Sail ho! I knew the smoke trick would work. I'm going to scurry to the passengers' quarters no, to I'm check gonna... on Lalika and Nadia. Okay, they're in there. I'm going to check out this room some more. Renyard, you see a ship heading your direction, black sails. All right, I'll start uh, mentioning that to, to the survivors, right. the surviving crew, that they better uh, at least have something on them. They nod. Valak, you're studying this glyph, and whoever did this was very subtle. The glyph itself is not a temporary one, and it was used most recently last night or the night before. Under the bad moon. You know that this glyph was referenced in one of the books of Skelos. The books of Skelos are considered the most secret of all esoteric lore. And you saw it once long ago. As soon as you saw it, you were like, somebody has read the book of Skelos because this is in it. And it's to draw upon primeval power of the aboriginal. That could definitely cause a crew or a group of people to go batshit crazy. Right. Bloodlust, blood all that stuff. It could be side effects of this summoning. They went both batshit and deep shit. Is there anywhere that I can stand where I'm closer to what's happening in front, but also making sure that nothing gets down to the You could stand at the at the top of the at stairs, the top of the stairs. Okay. and watch. Yes. So I'm going to go up to the top of the stairs and be like, what's going on? The tousle-haired head of Lalika pokes out of the shadowed stairwell. Stay put. Okay. Um, we have a hidden room down here we could hide them in. The room worries me. The room, the room itself is just a room. It's been used for the magics. The sleek, black, double-masted ship cuts quickly towards the Kamar. Squat ahead of the foremast and high of the poop, she is a vessel of war. Black sails bulging and its 20 sweeps per side propel her at the floundering slave ship with deadly intent. Horror crosses the faces of one of the surviving sailors. That, that is the Black Rose! Renyard turns to the man seeking clarification. The significance of his words were lost on him, but judging by the man's distress, it was obvious that this Black Rose had a nefarious reputation. Clanging of dropped weapons attract the Poitanian's attention, and he turns to see the men around him fall to their knees in despair. As it's closing in on you, you see a vicious-looking ram jutting from the beakhead, and it's coming pretty quick. Nice. Like they're going to ram us? You don't know. They're just trying to get here to rescue us really quickly. All right, so they run up a distress flag. The black ship turns off of its course, immediate course, and begins to come alongside. And the first thing you see is lined up amidships are ten archers drawn and ready. Then you hear a shrill whistle, and they lower their weapons. And then you see the plain figure of a slim girl hmm. holding a Hyrcanian bow, setting it down, and then yep, barks another order, and then they put their weapons away. The archers step back, and a group of armed men step forward, and they all start throwing grapples, and they all hook to the side, and leading them is a monstrously tall gaunt-looking man. Hmm. Yeah, I go back and rehide the hidden room. Renyard, what are you doing? Oh, I'll... Uh, and the men look, lay, look to you. Lay the sword of Duran at my feet. Do you drop your weapon? No. Okay. Not if they then, can't see me. Well, then from one of the top sails, you hear a female voice say, there's one in the stairwell. Oh, there's shit. one in the stairwell. Do Her, I even know Hercanian. what they're saying? It's Hercanian. I don't speak Hercanian. Snap my fingers. Point at you. Yes. <laughs> I'm just standing there like, what's going on? Come out. I'll listen to Renyard. And don't look threatening. <laughs> Impossible. Yeah, don't look. Threatening. I leave my I leave my axe at the stair and then just come out mm-hmm. a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll come up with my uh, my scimitar in one hand by the scabbard and my short sword in the other hand, also in the scabbard. 
but okay. I want to keep my dagger hidden on me. Oh yeah, I just dropped my axe. Okay, I'm wearing have voluminous black robes. So, so, standing atop the aft deck of the black ship stands a honey-haired woman wearing an open-necked white silk shirt with wide sleeves billowing in the steady breeze. Her tight breeks, tucked into wide-cuffed supple boots, crimson sash tied at her waist. She stands motionless, black-gloved hands resting on the glittering hilt of a cutlass at her side for a long while, until she raises one hand and motions to a figure clinging to the rigging of her ship with the quickness of a cat. A lithe form bounds headlong from the outermost yardarm of one ship, grabbing the bunt line of the other, using it to descend to the deck and stand before Rignard. The wiry figure was a woman, Zingaran by his estimation, with braided black hair interwoven with multi-hued ribbons. A sneer on her face and finely honed thin bladed sword in her hands shatters any illusion that this beauty was not a killer. Who is in command here? I raise my hand. <laughs> I also raise my hand. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't have even understood her. Dang it. I don't raise I my do hand. I do speak your Arcadian, so I raise my hand. I just look confused. All right. That's going to be my answer to Go everything. Go for it, <laughs> The woman up on the, the rear deck is watching everything that's going on. Her hair's blowing in the wind, and she takes a uh, a red sash, and she wraps, wraps it around her hair so that way her hair doesn't blow in her face as she's watching. And you see a white-haired man step up next to her and starts talking to her. And it's all hot chicks and dead dudes. Hmm. Yeah, no, this is not a. It's not a, like a pale dude. This is just a white-haired dude. A seer. So hot chicks and old dudes. Yes, and he and he's pointing right at Valak. Oh. White is hair it, or like a that seer? One, he's in charge. Like an Aesir? No, it's like it's like he's just unnaturally like silver-haired man. Oh, okay. Steve but Martin. not like, like Steve not Martin. like my white hair. No, not like yours. The the woman standing there who swung down, she's wearing a flowing shirt as well with tight pants but no shoes. She's barefoot. She looks at Rignard. You are the captain. I am not. Unfortunately, uh, my guy is uh, not charismatic. He's kind of ugly and shunned by the opposite sex a lot. He's always got this perpetual sneer on him that's hard to overcome. Uh, I am only in charge of this vessel because of uh, my might, but uh, I do not claim ownership of it. She looks over her shoulder. The woman on uh, the top deck nods. Very well. I will escort you aboard the Rose. Rose. To talk? Yes. Okay. She wants to talk, I shall say, to the rest of you in uh, what Zamorian is our Zamorian. comment. Zamorian. Yeah. I don't think so I speak. So far, Zamorian the only thing you've heard me speak in. The armed men start making their way across, mm -hmm. and they start spreading throughout the ship, I kinda, heading towards the hold, uh -oh. heading towards the below I kind of tense up. And the big guy is coming along with them. Did we explain what happened to the crew yet? Not, Not yet. yet. Not, Not nope. yet. I'll go to the other ship. Kind of in passing, as the men are coming over to the to, to the woman that first swung over, tell her that we murdered the the crew for getting rapey last night. She nods. So you killed a bunch of sailors. In our defense, we they had it coming. What with the rapiness? She does not seem impressed or taken. She I'm just, not saying it like she should be impressed. I'm just saying uh, it like I said in passing. The uh, dark-haired beauty that swung down uh -huh. onto your ship escorts you over to the other ship. I only have one request. Watch my sword. All right. The ten men searching the ship, they hoot and holler when they see Lovaisa. They really hoot and holler when Nadia comes up. After the initial group of guys comes over and starts looking around, and then they hoot and holler whenever the two passengers come up. They're standing next to Lovaisa. The, and uh, I'm still... I can... If I need to, I can still grab my axe. Yes, you I'm could. I'm still close enough. The, the very tall man walks up to you and says in Nordheimer... Hmm. Oh, is this the one with white hair? This is this is the the the, the real pale, pale guy. One. Okay. You are a long way from the frozen waste, Aesir. Uh, I'm kind of shocked. When he says it, and in the accent you say, he says it, you know this is a Hyperborean. Okay. Nice. Are you a Hyperborean? He nods. I have not seen the lands of my home in a very long time. And he's as he's watching his men go through the ship, and they go like in into the captain's quarters, and they you know, we've got treasure. We've got treasure. You put that back. <laughs> How did you come to be here? Did you escape the thraldom as I had? No, I'm not a slave. I've been searching for my family, who was captured by slavers. Only my father remains. I am called Tomar. I'm Lovaisa. When Rignard is escorted to the other ship, taken to the, mm -hmm. the rear deck, and before this very beautiful woman, in her middle age, the man next to her, the white-haired man, as you approach says, Anna, who is this you bring before our queen? I uh, remove my helmet. I'm Rignard Durand of Poitain. She nods. 
You are welcome aboard the Black Rose, Renyard Durand of Poitain. Be at ease. Before she can speak again, the white-haired man says, What is the nature of that man right there? And he points right at Valachius. <laughs> I just wave like an idiot from the deck. Came into association with him when I was hired to bodyguard him. It was an Argos. I do not ask too many questions. He nods. My queen, he is the most dangerous one on that boat. I am. And she looks at him sideways as this you know strong swordsman comes yeah. as standing before. And he says, were it my decision, my lady, I would scuttle the boat with him on it. Bye, Mark. And then she smiles and she says, It is fortunate, then, that I am in command, and therefore not your decision, Pelias. Yeah, I'm still grinning like an idiot. Can't hear a word. He is no threat. Yeah, as far as Mike really knows, I'm just this weird dude who fights like a mental patient. I've pulled his ass <laughs> out of trouble more times than I can count. The beautiful woman looks at the squat slave ship with obvious disdain. And how is it you have come to possess the Kamar? And where is her captain? I'll shake my head, put my helmet back on. You would not believe my tale. I scarcely believe my tale. Needless to say, the slavers that we paid for passage on the ship had uh, bad intentions for us. I see. And again, where is he? Where is this ship's captain? That is where the story takes a strange twist. The husk of his corpse still uh, lays on the ship from whence he strange and unbelievable creature tore his heart from his chest. She turns her blonde head towards the man at her side, who looks flatly at her for a span, then turns his eyes on Renyard. I would very much like to see that. Many years have passed since I last stood on the deck of the Kamar. I would very much like to feel her deck beneath me once more. Her smoldering blue eyes take on a distant, pained look before they harden, her mouth tightening. This time, a free woman. I apologize for its condition. Hand lightly touching the shoulder of Durand, she steps close to him, the perfume of her sweet breath hot against his cheek. Do I have your permission to board her, my lord? It is all yours. So she you gathers all our treasure. Arms crossed, the Azir watches as Renyard, the odd white-haired man, and the golden-haired pirate queen casually walk the deck of the Black Rose and then board the Kamar. She marvels at the majesty and grace of the woman, as well as her distinct power and control over those in her command. Loveasa can see that this woman is a slayer. She turns her eyes to the gaunt man towering beside her. Be honest. Do you have ill intentions with us? Tomar eyes her without turning away from his approaching queen. My queen has given her word that you are to be spared. I point at Renyard's sword like, It hasn't moved, Renyard! Th- thank you, Valak. I'm really, uh jonesing to pick my sword back up. The white-haired man, as he's walking, he's eyeing Valak suspiciously, but the woman has completely disregarded him, walks right up to Lovaisa and says in Nordheimer, Hail to you, daughter of the snow. It has been long since I have seen an Aesir. The sight of you warms me. Lovaisa nods in appreciation of the queen's use of the Aesir formal greeting. She opens her mouth to reply and is cut off by the queen when the woman shifts her eyes quickly to the brutish Hyperborean beside her. Do not get any ideas, Tomar. And then Uh she starts to walk down the steps. Nice. Oh, no. She eyes the two passengers as they pass and then goes back into the captain's quarters, walks in the door, and then she stops, turns around. What is the meaning here? Where is the captain? And you're looking there and the body is sitting right there. Point at it. That is Simok. Where is the captain of the ship? Where is Milos? Start towards them and I say, uh, in, I'll go ahead and say it in Nordheimer. What'd you say about Milos? I asked, where is the captain of this vessel? Where is Milos? We're chasing after Milos. With his own ship? Simok was the captain of this ship. The man, the white-haired man, chuckles and she gives him a harsh look. Simok, the business proxy was no sea captain. A first mate, in title only. No, Bakai was the first mate. All right, and then the white-haired man laughs again. Bakai? My dear, Bakai is the nomen of which Milos was given. His family name. Motherfucker. Eyes widening, in dawning horrible realization. Loveza wheels to Rinyard, who stares puzzled at her, unable to understand what was said, but knowing by the barbarian's demeanor that something was wrong. We've made a terrible mistake. We were chasing Milos. On his own ship, he was Bakai. Sudden realization of this, and I'll uh, take off my helmet and I'll 
Simon on the floor. What? What do you mean? Milos. Milos was Bakai. Simok is his first mate. Milos is the one we can't find. The only missing crew member. Things are starting to make more sense. Where did he go? Well, we haven't found him yet. The group stands in silence. Weight of missed opportunity pressing on the companions. Until the queen turns her head to the white-haired man at her side, who nods at her, clearing his throat. We claim any slaves aboard this ship and welcome them to our crew. An invitation is extended to you and your companions, Lord Durand. You may join us or be welcomed as protected passengers, should you wish it. She kind of waves her hand at, like, the chest and all that stuff. (laughs) Consider your passage aboard the Black Rose paid in full. We are indebted to you for your hospitality in Aquilonia. She nods. As long as you are under my sail, you are granted protection of the Queen of the Red Brotherhood. Then I will pledge my sword to the Queen of the Red Brotherhood. While they're uh, taking whatever they want from the ship, I'm going to be back in the hidden room taking copious notes. I'm just straight up gathering my stuff. The sun sinks redly, turning the azure waters of the inner sea into a sparkling pool of blood as the last of the squat slave ship, the Kamar, slowly surrenders itself to the depths of the Villette. Renard Duran stands at the foot of the poop deck ladder, watching the sight with disinterest. At his side stands the strange white-haired man, Pelias, who shares in the Poitanian's apathy of the dying ship. Lord Duran, I am curious. I am no stranger to tales of slayers, be they common, noble, or kings. Would you honor me by telling your account of the clash below the decks of the Kamar? Well, I'm perfectly happy to talk about that. Atop the poop, surveying the sinking ship, Lovaisa stands beside the pirate queen, sharing the moment. In the hours since the remaining crew of the Kamar were pressed into the service of the Black Rose, and now, the queen spent most of her time in quiet conversation with the Aesir. The woman seemed keenly interested in her quest and her company, but for reasons never expressed to Lovaisa, except to say that in her life she trusted no one save those few of barbarous nature that earned it. In a way, the Aesir felt a kinship with the woman that was difficult for her to express. Perhaps it was the sight of a woman earning respect among fighting men. With twilight upon them, the queen turns her sea-blue eyes to the Aesir. I know well the island that you seek and the dread tower nearby. Though you have my sympathies, Aesir, I will not risk my ship to that diabolical place. I will see you and your companions as close as I dare. Give you a launch and provisions, but that is all. I accept. We accept. She looks from the barbarian's ice-blue eyes to the forms of Nadia and Lalika on the main deck, standing at the port side rail, watching the sea. That island. It is not a place for a soft dancing girl or a child. I wish only for their safety and for them to be provided for. Her hard eyes turn to Lovaisa. Caring for soft folk is not my trade, Aesir. She nods to the bowmen gathered near the mainmast and the young woman they surround protectively. It is true that I have accepted young crew members in the past, but Nir Gui was an exceptional case, not something I wish to repeat. I tell her what I know of Lalika, of her being sneaky and brave. That may serve the child well in a port city, but this is a ship of blood and plunder. Life among us is arduous. As for your dancer friend, I have even less use for her, beyond distraction for the crew. The choices are grim. I take them, and you risk their innocence, or they accompany you into that hell. I will have to talk to them. Arms crossed, Pelias soberly listens to the rumble of Renyard's voice in the dark as he watches the forms of the Queen and the Aesir from afar. I was lucky in the order. Went after that one first, and then killed that one. He's not this one. He's smiling. He starts asking you about the places you've traveled, and as you're telling him... He's giving you details of the places that you've been. So you realize that this guy is very much a seasoned traveler as well. He says, you travel with an odd companions. Not that I have not traveled with odd companions before myself. My road is winding, and I do not have a destination in mind. Uh, instead, I have a goal. Ah. And uh, that is to seek my equal or better in the uh, art of swordsmanship. He smiles. But your path is leading you north. Unfortunately, I must uh, sell my skill along the way. The conversation turns towards your current group goal and your traveling companions. 
this isle, this uh, Milos. The uh, nature of the mission may be different for my companions, but right now my uh, hate is uh, just as fine-tuned as perhaps you and the uh, your crews for this uh, Milos. I do not like to have our uh, pacts and oaths be broken and to be taken unawares. Uh, even uh, pirates have more honor than this Milos. So it seems. This island that you are traveling to, I have seen it, and I have seen what is beyond it. I must warn you, my friend, it is not something to be taken very lightly. The tower itself, its power originates from the cosmic gulfs. It is the home of madness and horror. You must gird yourself for that. He says, luckily for you, I have something to offer you. Oh, really? He reaches into a pouch and he pulls out what looks like a can- like a camel hair or maybe like a, like a hemp necklace with a charm on it, a silver medallion. He holds it out to you. I obtained this Long ago, it will help you. All right. It will help you uh, protect your mind from cosmic influences. It is uh, a strange article, but I uh, thank you for this. As you're holding it, you realize it's actually woven hair. The necklace is woven hair. Right. It's uh, a little below my standards. I'm out here in the wilds, so I will uh, take him on his word. The white-haired man's eyes glitter like dark jewels in the starlight as he watches Renyard hold the necklace in his hands, the darkness masking his toothy grin. Wind whistles through the gorge like the moaning of a battered soul. Born on the wind is a faint scent of rotten corruption of that soul as it dies. The floor of the narrow gorge gradually rises until the crevasse opens to reveal a dark wooded veil. Beyond the trees juts a spike of jet like the head of a colossal arrow pointed to the heavens. Approaching the tree line, the source of the noxious stench that was only hinted at before becomes painfully clear. Though the trees are in full bloom, they are infested with a strange rot that has putrefied them. Viscous gray ichor oozes from rents in the trunks, whose fetter is so powerful it brings tears to the eyes. Foliage, usually vividly hued and vibrant in this time of year, is listless and gray. No chirp of bird nor insect song can be heard. Rustling of limp leaves and branches from occasional gusts of wind are the only sound. This, coupled with the powerful combination of soul-wrenching decay, blankets the woods with a sense of imposing dread. I don't want to die in this place. Fear not. No fear. Don't bury me here. Oh, I would not bury you here. As you move towards this spike of jet beyond the trees, everybody make a notice check. Ten. Six. Seven. Rustle of leaves is all the warning the companions have before a wet, ripping crash of vegetation sounds. All but Mofir bound away as a massive, angular block of greenish stone strikes the sword with a thunderous impact. That's a big rock. And it clearly came from the tower. No. No? The trajectory was straight through the trees. Well, who's this? Rancid dirt showers the mystic as he idly stares at the object that nearly pulverized him. Thanks, Mother Earth. Long and narrow, nearly as tall as the Zamorian who stood beside it, the stone was fluted on one side like a chunk of some massive, slimy green steatite column. I lick it. This is a nice rock. Thank you, Mother Earth. Mount it. From the shadowed trees moves a monstrous shambling bulk, a grotesque, anthropomorphic travesty of creation. Evolutionarily speaking, it is not that distant from a man, though its bestial face has close-set ears, flaring nostrils, and a great flabby-lipped mouth in which gleams white tusk-like fangs. Covered with shaggy grayish hair, mixed with silver from the crest of its head down its back, its great misshapen paws hang nearly to the ground. Its tremendous bulk is supported by short bowed legs. Its bullet head rises well above that of the tallest man. Its massive hairy breast and giant shoulders are breathtaking with huge arms like knotted trees. Silently, but for the puffs of breath from its mighty lungs, the monstrosity charges. Take cover! I don't take cover. I was thinking throw boulders. I'm going right at it. Closing the distance. Cold shot, minus four for a headshot. So is this guy bigger than a normal? Yes. Okay, so minus two for a headshot? That's fine. Okay. Seven. Seven is a hit. And the call shot does plus four damage. Eight plus four is twelve. Shakens it. The great beast halts its charge and rears its bowed legs, grasping at the stinging thing needling its eye. 
It thrashes in pain, trying to rid itself of the object. Frenzy two-fisted. So Ooh. 10 and an 11. Both hit and are both raises. 16. 23. Blinded, the monster fails to see the pick close on him until it was too late. Massive jaws open in a mute scream as the savage tears into his neck with one of his axes. Before the brute can even react to the new source of pain, Odred cleaves its bullet head with his other axe, showering himself with clumps of blood and brains. This dead monstrosity lays before you. How far away is the tower? Uh, it's quite a distance. We need to get there quickly. You start moving into the dank trees. I'll stay close to Mofir, so if another rock comes in, I'm going to try and deflect it okay. with my uh, face. Oh. Face. <laughs> my face. <laughs> okay. Dense black vegetation gives away to a glade of languid gray grass. Marbled green stones jut from the corrupted sward in patterns suggesting that they were once walls of some immense structure. Deeper toward the center of the clearing, the stonework is more pronounced, forming a labyrinth of green walls and arches. In most stands the monolithic black spire whose visage wavers like a mirage. Looking directly at it causes a slight pain to grow like a seed behind their eyes. The pain grows more and more intense until it pulses down their jaws, making their teeth feel as if they were to burst at any moment. Inspecting the crumbling green walls, it is difficult to determine how long they have been here. Colored like marbled jade, they are made of an unnaturally dense material. From the level of decay, it is not unreasonable that these stones have stood for thousands of years. The surface is worn smooth in most areas, but there are sections that have withstood erosion and bear etched hieroglyphics and geometric designs whose concentric patterns overlap unnaturally, evoking waves of nausea. As the crumbling ruins grow more structured deeper within the glade, the etchings are more distinct and it becomes difficult to focus on direction. Make a spirit check. Nine. Get a nine. Oh, double one. I have a nine. I'm Benny. Nine. The etchings on these green stones just really evoke this strange unease at this point, and looking at them too long starts to get, make you dizzy and nauseous. Mofir, Mother Earth has stopped talking to you. Mother is dead. I'm sad. I'm sad. Mother Earth has gone quiet. No, you're actually normal now. Shut up. I knocked the mud off your forehead. <laughs> that gorilla, the stone it threw, was a piece of this outcropping or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Of the same material, yeah. yes. I have a feeling there will be more. Odred and Mofir, out of the corner of your eye, through an archway you see a shadowy form move. Blocks of dense green stones rain down from on high. Shaggy forms of gray apes appear atop the walls while a group of them charge from the yawning mouth of a large open archway. Odred wheels and rushes the oncoming brutes as a startled Madadai fumbles with his bow in a vain attempt to draw an arrow from his quiver. Mofir smiles with glee. Frenzy two-fisted. Eleven and a seven. One straight up hit, one raise. This is the raise. Okay. Ten. He's staggered. Are Round. you attacking one at a time? Yeah. Twenty-four altogether. The pick leaps, arms wide as if to embrace the onrushing horror. His axe is buried deep in the beast's chest with a sickening crunch, and the wild man rides the dead monster to the dank loam. I'm going to do an air effect on the three that was coming at us. Go ahead and roll your arcane skill and a d6. Their agility is a d8. Joker. 11. Fail, fail. I roll an 8, so that explodes. And that's a 13. Go ahead and roll your damage. 12. 12 damage. They are shaken. Mofir stamps his bare foot on the corrupted sword. A ripple of primal energy leaps from him and crashes into the rushing apes. He grimaces at the weakening of his power, obviously due to the unnatural decay infesting this land and has abated Mother's influence upon him. I'll roll for the two shaken guys. One is still shaken, the other one is not, so, but cannot act this round. Madadai gets his wits about him and quickly knocks an arrow. I'll uh, size up one of the uh, the ones throwing rocks. Uh, I'll do another headshot at one of the ones on the wall. Fourteen. Fourteen is a raise. Eighteen. A jet of black blood sprays from the creature's throat as it arches its back and plummets backwards off the jagged wall. In silent rage, the apes on the ground grasp and flail at Odred, whose wilderness-honed reflexes save him from being rent by tusks or having his skull crushed by massive fists. The remaining brethren on the walls fill their grotesque hands with large rocks and target the men on the ground, one striking the wet turf with a dull thud. But one missile flew through and strikes the one who brought thunder from his feet. Mm, no fear, you take... All of it. Oh! 
That's a lot of damage. God. <laughs> it's 18. 23 damage. Oh. Toughness 5. That's four wounds. Mother oh, Earth. God. All right, spend a Benny. Three. Oh, God. Benny for a reroll. Benny for a reroll. So, second Benny spent. You can spend as many Bennies as you want in a round. Oh. Six. Hold it again. Six reroll. Six. Six. Seventeen. Woo. Mofir turns just in time to avoid the stone hurtled at his head. Jagged edge catching his shoulder as it passes, slicing it wide. Blood instantly fills his shirt and soaks into his coarse camel hair robe. Frenzied, two fisted. A seven, nine. Two straight up hits. Six. Six damage doesn't even penetrate its hide. Two. All right, Mofir. Mofir. You know this, Sean, from MMO. You take out the range. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm going to do a blast. They're separated, right? Yes, so they no are. area there. Right. So, yep, just a straight up blast at one of them. Spell weaving? Yep, spell weaving and, and a D6. D6. Six. You succeed. So roll your damage. Twelve. He's shaken. Rumbling of the earth causes the slick green wall to buckle. Suddenly, the ground explodes in a burst of execrable soil and rock. The stooped creature drops its next missile, clutching at its eyes. One on the wall shaken, one is not. Two on Odorid. Odorid seems to be handling himself just fine. I, I figured that was coming. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take uh, I'll take the non-shaken one on gotcha. the wall. Uh, same deal. Headshot. Eight. Eight is a raise. Twenty-four. A second hairy devil joins its mate in hell as an arrow from the Hyrcanian's bow pierces through its tough hide and buries in the throat of the beast. Grabbing at the wall for support, it slides over the ledge, leaving a smear of dark blood where its hand found no purchase. This is a six. Your best roll was a six? Yes. Yeah. Hit. I didn't think that would happen. Pretty easy to hit. A gorilla. Nine. Nine damage does not penetrate its fur. Odorid spins, axes combing the back of a brute, trying to grab it. The one on the wall is shaken. Come on, monkeys. <laughs> who is don't, no longer who is no longer Don't shaken. taunt the monkeys, Jason. Two monkeys on Jason. Better that I taunt them than you taunt them. No, because if you die, they're coming right after us next. <laughs> Eight explodes. Death. Thirteen. Uh, yes. Perry is what? Nice. That's a raise. That is a raise. It's twelve plus three is fifteen. Stop it. Nineteen. <sighs> Stop it. 20, 22. 21, 22. You can soak that in your sleep. Toughness of nine. Three wounds. Son of a bitch. You're using the loft die? Oh my god, she'll fuck you. Deftly avoiding one foe, Odor turns into the attack of another. Slavering jaws crush down on the pick's flank, eliciting a groan of pain as well as a flow of crimson down his leg. You're at minus three, so you have no wounds left. Mo fear? Mo fear, do something, please. Uh, uh, what do we got? Uh, take out one of the one on him. Okay, I will uh, arrange myself in a line where I can cast this. I cast Monk Jet. Ten. You raise on both. Twenty-one. Odorant falls to the ground, grasping at his shredded side. A torrent of dust slams into the two hairy foes next to him. His ears ring with the howling of the wind, and his eyes clouded with grime. Shaking his head, the pet clears his vision in time to see the beasts writhe in the twisting cyclone as their flesh is quickly abraded from bone. As the gale dies, the remains of the apes fall to the earth. Thank you, Mofir. Yes, you're welcome. Let us see this through. I'll take a shot. Same deal. Twelve. That's a uh, raise for damage. Raise. Seventeen. Rearing up to throw another stone at those that killed its kindred, the last ape stops short and falls, arrow transfixing its lower jaw. Wind whistles through the green stone structure as Mother Earth's companions take further stock of their surroundings. Fully expecting additional creatures to assail them again, they pad slowly toward the center of the strange ruins and the horror that awaits them. Reaching a pocked wall, Odred clambers up to get a better gauge on direction. He reels atop the wall like a drunkard. With wavering hands, he braces himself and looks back to the black spire. The green stone walls ring a great gray courtyard where the ebon point extends out of the ground like a giant obsidian spearhead thrust into this reality from the bowels of hell. Odred fails to notice Matadai join him until his friend places a hand on his shoulder, more to steady himself than to announce his presence. He turns to the Hyrcanian and notices that he was not looking at the tower, at least not anymore. His attention was locked to a point beyond the hellish black structure, to the expansive sea, the Villiette, sparkling like molten gold in the setting sun.
Sitting silently in the slightly swaying launch, Ronyos broods over his situation. Very soon, he and his companions will go into the deep dark of the pre-dawn, proceeding to their destination, the Isle of Milos, the island in the shadow of the Tower of the Ape. He turns his eyes to Renyard, who is stowing provisions and preparing the craft for departure. The Zamorian's mouth flattened in shame. The swordman had seen him at his weakest, succumbing to terror in the face of the blasphemous red-eyed creature that had killed Simok. It galled Ronios that when Renyard looked at him, he felt the insult of his weakness renewed. The creature had done more than wound his pride. It had reminded him of a task that he had almost allowed himself to forget, a task set before him in the soulless dark beneath a black pyramid in the hinterlands of Stygia. He briefly shuddered. Then he turned his gaze to Valak, the gloom masking the sneer on his lips. The queer-eyed man played the fool exceedingly well, but Ronios had seen that game played too many times, by far better actors. His boorish antics may fool their slower companions, but they did not fool him, and very soon he would reveal it. Finally, he looks up to Lovaisa. The barbarous beauty still stood aboard the Black Rose, Nadia and Lalika clinging to her. Do not leave me here. I want to come with you. You will need me. Oh, damn it. Nadia, she's a little bit more easygoing and understands why you would leave her here, but it's, you're still leaving her with pirates. I mean, she's been, she's been a slave. She's been the consort of, a, of royalty, you know, so she's kind of been all over the place. So leaving her with a woman pirate captain wouldn't faze her in the least, but she is concerned about Lalika. They will not harm her. They will be safer with them. And we will, we can find them again. Where we're going, they do not, you know, you didn't want them to see the gore on the deck. That's Where we're true. going, they don't want to see that, for sure. All right, I turn to Lalika, mm-hmm. and I tell her, if I can, I will find her again. Then swear to me, Northrop. Swear you'll not die. And swear that you will find me. I can't swear that I won't die, but if I live, I will find her. So she tearfully watches the launch lowered as and she And I give her a hug. That's important. Before we get on the ship, I want to talk to the queen again. Okay. And I want to tell her that I'm going to try and come back. And I, I will take these two. She nods and she says, me. Though the rose is not the best home for them, I pledge to see to their well-being. I thank you dearly. And, and uh, Tamar, oh, Tamar is standing there with his arms crossed. On the souls of my ancestors, no harm will come to them. I take their word. <laughs> okay. And I leave them. I'll salute Pelias. Pelias nods to you as you as he's standing there next to the queen. I just stand on the back of the boat waving until the ship's out of sight. Grinning right. like an idiot. Dawn flashes on the eastern horizon of the inner sea as the lone boat toils toward the calm bay of the Dark Island. Sheer black basalt bluffs loom above the surface of the water for hundreds of feet, forming a colossal natural cove. Caves and other hollows pock the precipice, drinking the light from the growing day. Beyond the high northern cliffs, glittering wetly in the growing light, a spike of jet towers in the distance. Its sinister appearance causes the breath to catch in the throats of the boat's passengers, and oaths to different gods are muttered. You see dark shapes in the crags of the cliffs, and that's when the green stone bombardment begins. No! Big, Uh huge, green stones start flying from the caves at at you as you're rowing. Right now you're at a long range for them. We're starting it at target number eight. Dodge, dip, dip, dive, and dodge. Four rocks, and one hits the boat. D12, D6, plus two. That exploded. Fourteen, that's a raise. Mm -hmm. That's one wound on the boat. Boat has three wounds. And now whoever's uh, controlling the boat has to make a driving check. Uh, I don't have driving. Boating. I don't have boating. Sounds like a a vigor roll, then, to keep control of the boat. It's Uh, raw strength. So it'll be a strength roll. Oh, yeah. We'll do strength. Five. Dark water fountains from the impact of a mammoth stone striking near the launch. Salty rivulets run down Lovaisa's taciturn face as she heaves on the oars. The torque of her straining threatening to snap the stout wood. She hastily sculls towards an ominous black cave at the base of the far wall. The rift was long and narrow like a half-open maw set into the cliff. A terrible crash catches Lovaisa's attention as one of the oddly angled chunks strikes the side of the boat. The impact was so intense that all inside lurch violently. Valak, heedless of the danger around him, 
continues to stand astern, peering into the darkness. His folly causes him to be unbalanced by the sudden rocking of the vessel, threatening to dump him over the side. I grab Valak by the back of the shirt, barely keeping him on. Green rocks shower the helpless craft as the white gold-haired brute plies the oars with a tenacity and endurance of one bred outside of soft civilization. It was fortunate that who or whatever were casting the stones lacked accuracy, for only one in twenty came near striking the boat. Stroke! 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 I, I, I go faster. One hit. Oh. So that's a raise. Boat. 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 Hmm. Uh. That's eight, nine, ten. So it doesn't do a wound. It's not a raise. So it shakes it. It shakes it, so you have to make a strength check to keep control. Keep it going. Oh. Four. Having prepared for the possible impact of the barraging boulders, the passengers withstand the brunt of another stone striking their craft. The Azir takes notice of the fact that fewer and fewer missiles are hurtling towards them. Taking heart in this, she doubles her effort, hoping to take advantage of the fact that their attackers were reloading or tiring. Either way, they were closing on the cliff face and the safety of the cave. Nothing? I noticed. Yes, you noticed that there was only two. Or- Everyone did? Yeah. There's only two, guys. Miss. There's Miss. only one. We're in the clear. Oh. Don't stop now. Bro. Oh. Notice. Do I notice why? You're looking and you're like, there was only one that time. And then you look up and you see this figure up on the cliffs fall. Fall. Like, like plummet like, to like, its like, death. Yeah, plummet to its death. And it's as you're, not our death. Sorry, and you're, and it's this, lar- this large creature. And then as you're looking up, you see the billowing robe of a turbaned man holding a bow, waving his hand. It's Manadine! Thank you for listening. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Tower of the Ape. Please check for further episodes on our website, gamerstable.com. Any use of this production for commercial purposes is prohibited. Written credit for music and other properties used in this production can be found on this episode's dedicated webpage. Conan is the property of Conan Properties International, who have graciously allowed us to make this production. Savage Worlds Deluxe is the property of Pinnacle Entertainment Group. Openly Gamer Theater and Gamer's Table are trademark properties of Side Tangent Productions. 